Thanks, go ahead. Thanks, <laughs> thanks Christian. <laughs> and uh, yeah. thanks to White and Ducks and Mizzela uh, for having me here today. So just a quick little bit about me. Um, I'm a content lead at GitLab. And um, previously, I've worked on a lot of content-related projects, um, creating resources to teach kids, um, technical documentation, um, and I've also been in education space, so I've done a lot of teaching too, at a university level and at a school level, and I'm also a developer. Okay, so if you don't know what GitLab is, we are Git hosting, but we so much more. So it's not just a place to put your code, you can also manage your project, do your builds, review your, review your builds, um, and deploy. Pretty much everything you need to do to go from like idea to production, what we call it. So we have like these 10 steps, and you can do everything along the entire stage. So every month on the 22nd, we ship um, a new release. And with new software, it comes a, a lot of new documentation that we should be creating. Um, Obviously, we move so quickly, so trying to keep updated, up to date with, with the pace of the community and the pace of the developers is quite a challenging thing to do. And previously, it was only done by a handful of people. So we're starting to expand the, the documentation team and looking how we can get developers more involved, the community more involved. But the developers are definitely the, the starting point <coughs> of all documentation because they write the features or they update the features. They have to write the documentation. That is us. We're not a very big team. I think there actually might be some significant others in there too. And this was taken two weeks ago in um, Mexico at our, at our summit. So we do this about every nine months, get together. So you can see there's not a lot of us there. So there's not a lot of people to write documentation. Um, and I'll show you how we do it and how complex um, it can be sometimes. So I, there was some discussion um, in the previous talk where Becky mentioned strategies around how you structure your, your, your projects. Where do you use sub-modules? Do you do different repos? Um, we've gone for different repos, and the reason we've done that is our documentation always lives in the source project. So documentation for our community edition, which is the open source for um, GitLab, is uh, in, the project. in the project. There will be a docs folder, and you just go and edit it right there. The reason we don't want to separate docs from the projects is we want to keep put docs in the same place that people are writing the code, so it's an easier connection. There's not another excuse not to do it. It's right there. And we've done that for every project we've got. So those are our products, GitLab C, EE, Omnibus, um, uh, the runner, and uh, our handbook is actually part of our main website. At the bottom here. So the docs, the main docs project actually goes and clones all those repos, pulls the docs folder out, and then we'll rebuild uh, the full documentation site. Our stack, as it is now, is uh, we use Nanak. It's a Ruby static site generator. We use all our own tools. So we use CI to create various stages, uh, to do all the cloning of projects, uh, building all the individual things, linting, and then deploying to a review app, um, and our CI runs on Docker. So we go just use a stock standard Ruby image and um, we configure various stages in a, in a little simple YAML file. And uh, we then deploy each branch to a review app. So a review app is basically what uh, we were discussing, what was discussed in the previous conversation about um, a place to view your stage changes. And then if you're happy with that, your changes, you can see it right down there. So the nice thing is you don't have to have a technical person run it locally, or you don't have to have anything set up locally. You can just make a change in the, in the editor, wait for the deploy, and um, then approve, give it someone to merge. And uh, we use triggers from various our various repos to, so for instance, I commit in GitLab CE and I update the documentation. There's a trigger that'll go ping this project and it will go, okay, something's changed in the GitLab CE project, let me go rebuild the documentation for that. Because it's, we had, had to kind of have a way of like automatically doing it versus doing manually, or just doing it on like a loop. So what we used to do is we used to just roll the docs every 30 minutes and deploy it. So you always, the problem with that is like you would have a gap in between of, um, you know, you make a change, you wait for something to go live, and you just had to wait for this, the 30 minutes, or it might even be an hour where now it just happens instantly when there's uh, some new changes out there. So this is how um, it is now. It wasn't so fancy. Uh, we were just using a simple generate Ruby script that we wrote that uh, just cloned a few things, 
It wasn't even using a static site generator. We were just passing it through like various view engines, and um, then we would wait for the build server to to pick it up every thirty minutes. Or something. So it was quite cumbersome for people to contribute. And then the biggest reason for us to do this is not only just to, to use all our new products we've developed since we did the original documentation side, was to um, make it easier for people to contribute. So I think we're never going to be able to, with such a small team, to keep up with the, the pace of our developments and uh, all the great things the community is doing. So we need to make it easier for anybody on our side who feels like, I can create a great tutorial for GitLab, I can create a great Git tutorial be able to just jump in there, create an issue, and view the changes. So I'm going to jump through like what, this look, what the setup looks like, and I'll give you a demo at the end of how someone actually goes about doing this. So we've defined in a YAML file a, all our products. So we have uh, CE, Runner, EE, and all the other ones are listed before. It's just a simple definition of what a product is. So if we wanted to add another product to the documentation, we'll just add another description like this. Then there's a rake file, which is just a Ruby script that goes and clones everything, brings it into the local folder, and then we have a, a Nanak. We just do Nanak build, and, and Nanak will build the entire site. So here's an example of this um, YAML file for the build steps. So you can see it's just using a, a, a Ruby 2.3 uh, Docker image, and we define some stages like test and deploy. And you can see something that basically what it does here is it will, let's do the, yeah. So the verify compile is another step where we can go and check that everything we try to build worked. So what this looks like in our GitLab UI, because this is quite confusing, a developer sets it up and it's done. But the <coughs> nice thing is like if you want, you just clone our project, you get our exact setup. There are various other CI templates that you can use for any static site generator that pretty much will just give you review apps straight away. Um, what it looks like from a pipeline point of view in our UI is you get these uh, various steps that are linked together. And you can see when something fails. Um, for instance, uh, linting the, the SAS files. If you someone like didn't type the variable correctly or uh, is not obeying rules, like putting multiple CSS rules in the same line, we'll catch it and we'll warn you to change it. You can get quite fancy with your, your linting steps. Uh, I think what we're planning to do is do the spell checker in the linting stages. And we're right now, it's, we kind of, and I think this is probably someone, everyone who writes in Markdown will find is that they're relying on the, the writers to use the correct program to check spelling and grammar. But the problem is that you're not using Word anymore, so you haven't got that quite a sophisticated mm -hmm. grammar and spell checker. So you use whatever you can plug into Sublime or whatever you can plug into Atom. But it's, it's just not good enough. And I think you need a consistent way to do it without having each writer having a setup locally. So we're going to put that into our steps, um, into, our, so into our pipeline, so that it's just done automatically and it doesn't slip through. So once those steps um, pass, you can you can define if something if something fails, like you won't go to the next stage. We've made it. Whoa, I'm jumping ahead. We've made it so that uh, this step here can fail, and it'll, what it will do is then it, it will deploy a review app of your new branch, and you have the option of stopping that at any time. So what that looks like is in the UI, you'll basically say the pipeline's um, finished, and you get a link to your site. You click on it, and you can go view your changes. And uh, this is just an example of the triggers. So these are balls that got, got triggered from someone pushing to the CE repo or the EE repo. That triggered our docs to start a new build and basically start the process of deploying again. So it looks probably looks quite tricky looking at these screenshots. I'll show you what it looks like in theory, and it's a lot easier when you, you kind of just dive through the UI. Um, if you want a full breakdown of um, every line of our documentation process explained, like what every line of our YAML file does and why we did it this way, you can go and grab the, the blog post. So that is a, a link to that. Or you can just go to our blog and, and uh, stop browsing through. That's a great comment on that. So, for, when considering to, to rebuild our doc site, there were quite a few challenges we encountered, and just some day-to-day -day things that we 
think we're always having a debate of should we do it this way, should we do it that way, what's going to be next. Um, so I'm just going to run through a couple of those right now. So you can always understand from a project management point of view, it's it's quite a complex thing to do to manage six different repos, um, make sure that everyone's and contributing documentation. Uh, what is the the process? What is the style guides like? Who's going to edit? Who's going to? There's so many things involved there. What we try and simplify it down to is that, given the trusting the individuals and um, giving them the freedom to make changes, um, and we require everyone who changes the code to change the documentation. What that means in theory is that we we don't have, most of GitLab um, will be completely remote, and most of the company is not uh, first language English. So that means uh, there's a lot of uh, developers out there that are going to need some assistance from editors. But what we do is they write the first draft, and then we'll get an editor on top of that and go and uh, just tidy it up, improve the style. No one actually owns or manages documentation as a whole. It's kind of everyone's responsibility to do it. And I was having some discussions about with um, some of you early on about you know, being aware of all the changes. We, we're never aware of all the changes um, until it's someone gives you a merge request and says, you know, I improved this, can you put it in? Our policy there is like, if it's better, if it's better than what's there, we'll merge it, uh, rather than trying to uh, trying to understand what, what's going on everywhere. I think it, it will be too tricky and it, it creates these layers of these bottlenecks there that I think we move a lot slower if we did that. Internationalization, that's something that comes up quite often, like, are we going to do internationalization? Um, at this point, we're not doing it for our documentation. But it's something that I think people, because we have so many different um, speakers of different languages in GitLab itself, and also across the world building software in GitLab, we often get asked, like, will you translate your, your docs to Russian or something else? The tricky thing is, like, it's so hard to get documentation right in one language that we're not tackling this mammoth task yet. I think once the, the dream is for me is once we get our a, a great strong community of writers who are contributing tutorials, who um, are improving our documentation, and they want to, and we can start building a, a community around um, translating, maybe some kind of, what we call it, like a dream, a crowdsource app to do that, or help people do that, we'll, we'll tackle that. It's the same policy we, we've uh, we've taken for our UI in GitLab. It's going to be English only at this point until there's a, a big need to do it otherwise. Um, and again, same reason. It is such a tricky thing to do. So we, we focus on one thing, get it right, and then we'll look at doing, doing the next language. Um, the reason I mention here is every time someone new joins or has a question about documentation, they go, oh, aren't we going to translate it? Aren't we going to translate it? Um, so what actually happens is we are documenting the answer to, <laughs> to that question. Um, and everything we do goes in a handbook. So yeah, all our processes, we, everything we do to onboard someone, to create projects, to know what the style guide is, how, how to publish webcasts, it's all in our handbook. So you can just Google GitLab handbook and, and see how we do everything. Generally, everything in GitLab is open except for a few very, very, very few things like financials won't be open. So everything about GitLab is on our handbook. The next challenge um, we're trying to tackle is making it easy for people to contribute um, documentation. So I think the UI, GitLab UI, really makes it considerably easier than trying to clone a project locally and worrying about setting up all the gems or whatever else you're using and then previewing the changes. We already make it easy to go, you just create an issue. On the issue, there's a new branch button, so you don't have to know that you created a branch or forking or anything. It, it kind of flows quite naturally. And then you go edit your changes right then and there. And as soon as you've edited it, you, you can go make a merge request, which is our way of saying, take the changes back. And uh, you can then preview them on your stage environment. So none of that has to be done locally. Um, and you can pretty much hide or you know, having to work command line and all the get keywords and stuff. It's just a save button and you can drag it up a bit. Yeah. So it's pretty easy. Then the next big task we're trying to do is um, because GitLab is on premise first, so each person, or each client, or each user could be running a different version of GitLab. Someone could be, we had someone on the day who was on version seven and they were asking for some support. Um, 
and we need to be able to like get get one of our experts and go like we need to help this guy how we gonna do it. So normally it's like go to doc, doc, documentation in your GitLab install. So not only is it on the website at uh, docs.gitlab.com, it's also in your server install. So you can access it on in GitLab. You click on help and you get it there. So the, the problem is like you've got to be able to direct someone to the particular page, and if you can't remember. You probably aren't running a version of seven, and you can't just direct them to go to two factor authentication and find this. So what we the next challenge is to host all version documentation on GitLab Docs, um, and it's pretty it's pretty easy given our current workflow. It's um, just a matter of cl cloning each tag version, and then giving it, it its own unique identifier. I think the tricky thing is about how we're going to make that searchable and usable, and you know, want to want to give someone the latest version while the you know, latest search results while they're browsing that. Um, the reason I say it's tricky because we because you're using static stack generator, you we not we didn't build search from the ground up. We've got a great search plugin, um, and it's about how we're going to put all the work we've ever done in an easy searchable way. It's not going to confuse someone, and that's going to be probably the, the biggest challenge with multiple versions. So what it looks like so far is like if you jump to documentation, you can hover over uh, one of the products, and you get a version there, and you can hop to that and see the latest version or master, stable, whatever you want. Um, yeah, that's going to come up soon in a, in a few months, hopefully. We've, this is a working version of it already on a review site, but we've got a couple of things to, to iron out. So I have left a lot of time for questions, and I'll probably want to show you how this works in um, GitLab itself, because I think it's it's one thing to kind of run through it like that, but if you see what it looks like and see what a review app is and how you preview the change, I think it will be a lot more useful. So let me jump straight into that, and we'll take questions afterwards. So I created a demo account right now, but I already forgot my password. So. <laughs> <laughs> just a second, just resetting it now. <laughs> Who's used GitLab yet, by the way? And for any static sites or just only, only one person for static sites. Okay. Two. Sorry, with you now. Any questions for me while I do this? I can multitask. Anything you'd like me to show more details of, or? Everything. So API docs, uh, blog posts, um, the handbook. It's, so, it's so I mean, down. rewinding to Becker's talk, which is uh, you know, similar kind of mixture of content from oh, the yeah. marketing splash screens to the low level you know, uh, HTTP responses from APIs. Yeah. yeah. Um, we are starting to move some of our marketing stuff um, into Marketo, which is our platform we use at the moment. Um, it's just to have some more control of um, tracking leads, but generally everything's just a static site. Um, it's mostly written in Markdown. But uh, I, I, I'd still like to see how we can make the Markdown writing process easier for people, because I think as developers, you, you get very comfortable using Markdown. Where We've got some writers recently who weren't developers first, and they used to do like a CMS, it's got a WYSIWYG editor, and I'm just trying to think about how we can make it easy for them to, to come to Markdown. Okay. And another question, you, you mentioned that you know, it's everybody's responsibility to contribute, and I think that's amazing to have the same thing where I am, but uh, how do you enforce or maintain a tone of voice in the house style? 
with, with our editors. So we have a few editors um, and we basically we aren't we don't try and enforce too much. I think we try to we come back to the policy of trying to make it as open as possible. And as long as someone's contributing something that's better than what's there, it goes in. So, but we, we will go and uh, rewrite something if it's, if it's necessary. Um, there are you should give it to someone to review your changes and. Um, we'll go do a first pass, might bounce back to them with feedback, just like like how you do in a normal normal merge request or something. Um, okay, so I just created a brand new account. I've logged in. This is the our website. So I'm going to go and view. Sorry, do you have the phone call? Oh yeah, sure. Better. There we go. Okay, so what I'm going to, I'm just basically looking for a merge request here. It's got a build pass, and I can show you what it looks like um, being able to go preview the changes. So this merge request would probably began as an issue, and someone then from the issue create click the new branch button, and then and you everything we do, like whether it's a blog post or it's it's already open, so anyone can go browse this at any point in time. I'm not logged in as my account now, but you can view all our work. So I'll probably, let's check this one. I'm just looking for one that's actually got the, the, the review app. So occasionally if the build's not passed or it's not ready or not deployed, you won't get a review app. None of them have review apps. <laughs> so normally there's a little link here and you can click through to it. I've always thought merge request was a much better name for request. It makes a lot more sense. It's well merge request makes sense from our point of view because you're not cloning a pro you're not forking something and asking them to pull it back. Right. So it makes sense from the way we, we get our flow our GitLab flow works. I don't find one now, then I'm just going to skip this. <laughs> I'll show you what the flow looks I like. I do, because I was really quite interested in my I know, I really want to show that. It's a, yeah, it is a really great thing to do. So. It'll take a while for the ball to, it'll take like 30 minutes for the ball to go through anyway. So, strange, not me. Just see. There. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> okay, not so sure that's not there. Because of live demos. Yep, <laughs> that is the problem. Let me show you what the workflow looks like and maybe they can let it run and see if it gets to that point. So we usually begin everything in an issue, so whether it's a right to doing something. They'll go create a new issue. So I'll go. Give it some. And then we we'll submit the issue. And then someone would, um, because we've set it up in a way that I'm not a contributor, someone will preview your issue. And once it's approved, then it'll be assigned to you. So then from the issue, you can then go and, so I've just picked any issue now. That would have been just like the one I've created. And if you have write permission on the, on the repo, you go click, there's a new branch button right here, and it just straight, takes you straight to editing the files. I can't do it from the demo account um, because of the permissions. I am, I, it's probably okay to, I wouldn't log in with my account yet to show you that, but um, the steps are exactly the same. So from there you click um, new branch, and then basically what you end up getting is you get dropped right into your your own copy of the project with the files, and you just navigate to something you want to change. So let's say for instance I'm going to change this file here. You can go and edit 
right there. And when you're done, you just go at the bottom, there will be a save button, click save. And then it uh, asks you, like, do you want to create a merge request? Click the merge request, and it will spawn up a link for you to go review your changes. And that's it, really. So uh, we've kept everything in the UI um, versus it's nice to not have a new writer who wants to do a quick blog post, have to go and hone out massive repos locally. And if you saw how complex the, the build step was, it was like six different projects. They all get pulled into one. I think if we require people to do that, we will get a lot less documentation written. Um, but because we've streamlined the process and used the UI, it's, uh, we find that it's just so much easier for a non-technical person to jump in. Any questions? I've got a question that might not be related to uh, directly to this. No, 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 anything you, at this point. How would you do? How do you do the, your your documentation structure, your hierarchy? Do you have a big YAML file, perhaps? Uh, so okay, can you just repeat the question because some people are behind are uh, away from the mic, so you can just repeat the question. How do you structure your uh, your documentation? Uh, into chapters, sub-chapters, uh, do you have a YAML file that gives you a full hierarchy with children and children all the way down? We, we try to not nest things too deep. Yeah. So this is another like topic that comes up quite often where people get stuck on the debate for too long versus doing things. So the minute we start doing that, we, we just try to find the most basic solution you can. So I think the most basic thing we've settled on is this idea of just single topics. Don't nest too deeply unless, for instance, if I was going to do uh, importers, like various importers to get projects into GitLab, I'll do importers and then I'll probably do a GitHub one in there to show you. And then I won't, I won't put that outside it on its own top level. So, but the problem there becomes like, and we, this is something we just debated like two weeks ago, like when you start doing tutorials and guides and, and then nesting things and those kind of things, what we try and do is flatten and as much as possible to the base topic um, just to simplify it. Like what current, what always happens is someone else will come along and have a different way of organizing information. So remove the hierarchy, the structure from your content and put the hierarchy in afterwards in a table of contents or something like that. And that's where we will go play with nesting and move things around. It's, I don't think there's one solution that fits everything. It's, it's, See what works for your team and your content, um, but just be flexible and open to change it. And I think also trying, I think what people forget is they, you're trying to push something, but you forget what you're trying to solve and why this solution is the one, you know, it's the best one for the company um, or your products or, or your team. And sometimes we, we've got to like stop the argument and go like, what are we trying to achieve here? Or we're trying to make it easy for people to write. We're trying to make it easy for people to discover. And maybe in a deep nest of structure will make it harder. So I think just bring it back to what you're trying to solve uh, rather than, I see a lot of people ask, like, what, what plugin engine do you use? Or how do you organize your content? Um, don't see those as, like, something to just necessary copy. I think I'd ask you, like, what does your content look like? Um, it's, uh, it's fairly hierarchical. We've got, uh series of products, and then inside there we've got a series of components. So generally it's uh, three levels. Okay. Occasionally what we'd like to prove that third level one step further. So maximum four. If it the grouping makes sense, do it. Like you can see we have, go to our main docs. I'll and always get prefixing titles where you know, to show that they are related. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. looks so it's not a group Yeah, it, 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 it does make sense to a point, but when you start like, you know, you start debating about how deep you nest things, I think just bring it back and go like, you know, does this solve a problem? If not, it's just it's just someone's point of view of how to organize information and someone's going to have That's the important. It's somebody's point of view. Yeah. And the person who's going to laugh on it is going to have a completely different point of view and not understand where they are. Yeah. Therefore, flat hierarchy, cross-linking to the latest content is, is often more powerful than, than a well thought out structure that works for your company, but not necessarily for your, for every end user. Definitely. What's also nice about having topics, um, like a flat hierarchy and topics being pretty much the first node or second node, 
is like your URL structure is quite nice then too. Like if you want to nest things and you like get you know, fanatical about making the URLs nested too, it gets get these long ugly things. Um, but if I can just go docs.gitlab for slash C for slash SSH and I get to something, that's quite nice. Um, so yeah, we also have these top level buckets. So I'll jump in here and then this is something we, we we work in this landing page, but basically if you jump into something, you can see there's a there's some nesting there. Um, but do it what makes sense for the content here. And don't follow our 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 example necessarily. So basically using this approach you get the, the wiki model of navigation where your navigation is part of your content. And then uh, so you, you don't get like a sidebar or, or things like that. So you, I guess that means that you can't do the, the menu that scrolls with your text thing? Yeah, we can, so this is basically a sidebar. We just put it up there so we can put it on the left there. Is that what you mean? Um, but it's like, well, I'm, I've been brainwashed by the DITA community. Mm -hmm. and, they, <laughs> so, and they have this thing with maps where um, maps are, are separate and then you can reuse topics in different maps. Okay. Um, and um, which is super powerful. Uh, and then you can, you, and also in Drupal, it has a similar concept where your navigation is one thing and then your content is another thing. Okay. And then you can, you can have your topics like, or your, your, your pages that are being referred from different menus. Um, and you can put those menus wherever you want and, uh, and you can do all kinds of fancy things with them. Um, and I, I kind of like that model um, but but you use it with every, everything, or is it, it it suits a certain scenario? I think I I like it that because then you you can do like two columns with like your whole table of contents for for a whole bunch of uh, topics that might have their own uh, topic and their own page, but then you you can still put them in one line and then maybe even load them one after the other. Um, so you you so you can have SEO for single pages with uh, um, an H1 tag for for the title for each of those topics, uh, combined with the like scroll until the end kind of thing that developers like a lot. Um, so I think it's, you've uh, got different. I think it's the debate is also about how people see how people navigate. So the digital world is that people navigate by links. Yeah. As the developer community is more navigated by what well, sort of markdown communities, a static websites is navigated by Google. You search in Google, you find the page, and then from there, ideally, you're on the page that should, they should be somewhere. You control it to where it is. If the static site um, sites tend not to have very good built in search, unless they, they, they're giving something in to sort of complement it. Um, there's the argument, oh, well, people will just do control F and it should be a static page. People will find it that way. So I think it's partly that there's different views on how people are navigating and finding information, whether Google's giving, giving them right to the correct page and they can go from there, or whether they're having to navigate slowly through. And I think it's partly the different views of, of that that influence sort of a different way of structuring things and a static site generator. Yeah. Yeah, world of things, seeing things. Yeah, I think so. Um, what you kind of described with different uh, table of contents and way of navigating, it seems like it's it's the view, the presentation, or the meta around it versus the actual content itself. But you are reusing it's, these. Um, I, I think it's the difference in um, in terms of information architecture. Um, if if you if your navigation is a separate thing. Um, then it, it makes it easier to have good labeling and to not to confuse your users too much with what, where the hell did I end up now. This is one of my gripes that I have with uh, people that uh, host documentation just on a, on a code repository. Like just, you, they don't even build a site, they just go, to, go here and, and other docs are there. Um, that it's, it's completely confusing because there's no navigation. And uh, the, the navigation is from the code repository. And, you don't know where you are. Um, well, if you if you have, especially if you have multiple levels down nesting, then you you need some way to tell people you're here, you're in this section, and up there's this stuff, and, and down there's this stuff. 
and, and kind of yeah for, for orientation purposes I would say um, but it's it's true if you just google then you don't need that uh, but we want that experience to and the navigation experience to be good so we are going to put a lot of focus on to to make it easy to find anything by just clicking around it's, and, it's more than finding it's knowing yeah. where you are where you've come yeah. from so when you click away you can go back to where you came from because you're yeah. following multiple threads and things and you learn more about the product yeah. because of the context because yeah. it's like oh this is part of this thing isn't it? like what's that and then you go and look and and Go google more. works well for one thing i was googling something today doing jekyll and i want to know how to do a specific thing yeah. so i just google and i find that specific thing um but when I started with Jekyll, I actually pretty well worked my way through all the documentation yeah. and I ignored some CNLs from expand, expand, expand. Okay, right, I think don't need to worry about that at the moment, but oh, I'll try that next yeah. heading and work my way down. All right, now I saw something about that. Where this is up there? It depends what you're doing. I, I think you need both. You can get great all search plugins, though, like. Um, um, so. Yes, I, and I've got a, a flare. That's just a It's very similar to, to Ditter. Yeah. So I'm setting yeah, up Yeah, I think the fact that we low-key think that it has to go to Google. Uh, and single sources yeah. as well. So yeah. the flare I managed well, to get one time. It is the yeah. default, yeah. yeah. Project I do have a question about your, um, um, your idea of having all these different versions of your of your documentation. How, how are you going to... I've seen many projects where they have open source projects that have gone from like version 1 to 2. And most of my searching does happen by the Google, and I always end up on the very one documentation, and I, there's no links. How are you have you thought about that already? How are you going to solve that problem? We we how haven't, going, especially how are you going to signal that it's all documentation? We haven't tackled it from like a search engine point of view, like external search engine, but in terms of I think it's going to be that you're going to have to do a lot more in the UI to tell someone what the latest version is, an easy way to link to the latest version. I think the Rails docs do a very good job of that. You know when you're on edge, you know which version you are. But then something like Java docs, I, I still get like 1.4 when I search for certain Java things. So, you know, there's always some ancient one that comes that will rank higher for that particular topic. Yeah, Rails does a lot of good things around deprecation as well. Yeah. Telling you upfront, like, this is available in these versions. So I think it's it's beyond just publishing it. Like yeah, yeah. say that we're just going to take this version and make it live. We don't have to. It's kind of it is a bit of a living document in a way. It, hopefully, it doesn't have to be updated as much as the your, your master. But I think it is important to make sure that the, na the navigation will, can easily take someone to the latest version. Um, but I think the trickiest thing is how how do you let search engines know that this isn't you know necessary anymore. Um, and you know, I think we'll have to experiment and see how that works. And this, you know, has anyone else done this? You can, can use the robots to text file. That's yeah. The way that people do. So you couldn't say, for example, I'm Googling an old feature. I actually do want to be taking the job off. It is useful. One, it's smart and it's like link well equals panel or something like that. So say to Google, this is the canonical version of this page, even though you'll find this content is indicated on all other websites and copy it or whatever, this is the real The other one I think I know that you bring the doctor is I've done this in a couple of other places, is the sort of master documentation it doesn't have any version strings in it. So you know, it's just sort of like, you know, docs dot, you know, python quest dot org slash session so such documentation. And then you only put a version string number and if you've explicitly built that so I really do want that exact one. So then the vast majority of instances are going to be hitting the sort of unversion of the search engine and what's that go. Google and some of that and that, that is the process we've taken so far, the, yeah. the structure. So the master's just got no your no string. Yes, that's kind of fragile if you I mean in the case that like you expect someone when you change versions and if you change the structure and things, but that seems like an edge case. People will have like saved the link and that one, that one precisely. So. Well, but but we'll again, as long as you know what yeah. version you are and when you're on yeah. the latest version. So it mustn't just yeah. be latest, it must be the information it's should say clear. version 8.16. So yeah. It must be very clear. Cool. Cool question. I think it's, uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll uncover a lot more issues once we actually start deploying it. So. What are you done? Uh, it's close. <laughs> it's very close. Um, we, 
we tend to try and ship things as quickly as we can and then we'll iterate. So that means like, don't make something too big, just put it out as quickly as possible. So it's, it's basically just a, a revision of our normal build, build process between two versions. And then we'll just, all those UX related things we I spoke about will improve those things. Um, some other cool things that we're trying to work on um, to make it easier for non-technical technical people to start using, whoops, to start using, um, <laughs> depending on the audience, I was going to talk about the Community Writers Program, because everyone here is uh, from a company or something. Uh, Oh, well, we you can get paid to write for GitLab. <laughs> so to try and encourage the community, we uh, we have a writers program, so you can get paid up to two hundred dollars, and uh, for tutorial videos, uh, anything basically, anything that's going to be a great contribution to our documentation, um, even technical posts. So if you just want to write something for blog, you can just go onto our um, onto our blog issues board and we'll basically follow the, get that all URL there it get, it's got all the instructions there and I'll tell you how to do it and it's pretty simple you can do it all from my UI you can preview your changes and yeah, um, so another thing what we're trying to do to make it easier for non-technical people who have never used static site generators to start using GitLab and GitLab pages and, and you know, write and mark down is we we've got a bunch of importers we're going to be writing so we're going to be running importers for uh, WordPress, Jekyll. So basically, directly take something and maybe just pop it in there. So obviously, Jekyll's quite easy. It's just a GitLab project, a GitHub or a Bitbucket repo, and you pull it in. Um, but we want to try and make it easy for you to just get WordPress content into a static site. And maybe even one step further, take a WordPress theme and get that into a static site theme. So those are the kind of cool things we're trying to make happen in the next couple of months. So from WordPress to static site, not the other way around. WordPress to static site, and okay. and then possibly, if possible, take the theme and make the theme a, a, a static site theme, a WordPress mm -hmm. theme with the you know it's like the head and the footer and the yeah. loop and all that. Basically, mm -hmm. take that and just turn it into a Jekyll site, or turn it into. You're working on this already? Yes, we've got a guy who's just all into importers. Um, awesome. And he wrote a, he wrote a, a media wiki oh, one. But this does require access to the, the WordPress database. Yes, but you, it's quite easy. No, no you can export yeah. file. There's a. Yeah, no <coughs> okay. But if you want access to the theme, yes, it requires a little bit more. But um, yeah. there's a bunch of other cool exporters. I think he wrote a, exported for a media wiki one, and he's working on a Redmine one. And basically, all these ways we can get people to put the content to get that. Um, so if there's any cool CMSs out there you think we should try and import? I already got, uh, which is the one that you're using? I don't know how many people are using Expression. Expression. Yeah. Suppose it depends on its usage. If it's been used for static content like documentation, I think it's it's an easy con conversion. But if it was, if you were using it for like a, I don't know, something a little bit more dynamic, it, it probably wouldn't uh, be a good fit for static sites. Any any last questions? Uh, uh, picking up on, just picking up. Um, getting my teeth in straight. Something that prompted you. Something you said earlier. Um, thinking. But um, sometimes we do a project and we have to pick a tool. And we have to think about what's going to happen when we go and the client has to maintain the documentation. And there's an attraction to the the. Um, commercial tools because they do localization, they do conditional text and all of that. Um, then there's the attraction of, of open source tools which are free and are easy to use. But um, the thing that always is the sort of worry is that if, you, if we built something in Git or GitHub and then gave it to a client who's not from a developer background, would they be able to grasp Git or could it be um, set up in a way where they could just write and publish like they could with a wiki, um, which they sort of, uh, um, Becky had sort of done, they built their own solution to try and get around that problem. This, this, I guess it's more of a general question, will, will Git get to a point where um, somebody who's not particularly technical can comfortably take a page, update it, create a page and get it published without having to know the 
It's an ounce of goods. I, I think we we there already. So our workload allows you to not understand. You don't have to understand Git. You can just do it all by clicking on buttons. Versus, oh, I'm going to gently challenge that because yeah. uh, when when you showed the example of the Bayes and the post, um, it posted to my mind how much more complicated that was in terms. Of oh, it's set. it's it's not a CMS for sure. Yeah. Um, it's still, but it's not running from the command line. Can we do better? Definitely. I know we can do better. And this, we debated this at the summit two weeks ago about like, I was saying like, how do we convince a work, someone writing WordPress to, to write in GitLab or using Git? We can make those five, 10 steps one instead of, yeah. So it's, I, the, the nice thing is I think more and more companies, non, um, code focused companies are starting to put information into Git. As if you've got a techno technology arm in your company already, because they're doing it, it's, it starts to seem like a logical fit to do that. So I don't think the trend's going to go away. So, you know, it, is Git going to be around in a few years? Definitely. Uh, so I don't think it's a bad thing to bet on. I think it's a very safe bet to do. Because it's open source and there's a great community around it, you also got that support. So I think. Got to look at um, commercial products can also just disappear. So there have been some great, great um, CMSs out there that just you know end of life. So having something that's open and free and has a great community is there's a, there's a positive thing about that. But sure, I don't think we get the the usability and the ease of use can definitely get better still. But it's not like you have to know how to use the command line, and we we're beyond that point already. But definitely, it can get better. On the, on the topic of tools, what I generally say when it comes to choosing your static site generator or something like that, try and find something, again, that generator you, you're picking should also have a, some active developers, more than just one, generally, and uh, see what great resources there are on the web, uh, see what other open source sites that you can go look at how they've structured things and built with that. That's kind of what I usually do when I'm trying to pick a new tool or something. That's exactly why I picked Jekyll. Yeah, check has got a great community. Exactly. Great, great lots community. and lots of resources. Well, it's maintained, I think, like GitHub. Uh, is it? Hugo? Uh, Jekyll. Yeah. Jekyll, I mean, uh, Hugo. Oh, Hugo's got one, okay. And also, I found a site that had like all the SAS static site generators listed in order of the number of downloads. And Jekyll was, I think it was Jekyll and Sphinx. Jekyll's quite high. Yeah. I think, yeah. So I thought that's great too. That's the, the two other things I would just flag if you're choosing a static site generator. Um, one is it's really nice if it if you can pick one that's written in the same language as your shop is using. Um, so, for example, I work in a mostly Python shop. We tend to use Sphinx and Pelican and Python tools because if we want to go in there and make a patch. That's much easier than having to have a separate environment set up entirely for our static site generator. The one other thing I would just flag is do pay attention to the license for your static site generator. Um, there's been a lot of uh, fluffle, fluff, fluffle in a couple of th in one of the chat rooms I'm in recently because, for example, Pelican, which is quite a popular static site generator, is licensed under the AGPL, um, which in certain companies is just a blanket no, we will not touch that with a 10 foot barge pole, go away. And there are interesting questions around, for example, if you take the theme of, if you take a theme from a static site generator and you combine that with your content, is that now polluted, tainted with the license of the static site generator? Um, I don't actually know what the license for Jekyll is, but I. It's got to be okay because it was the first thing that our security guys said. Sure okay. um, yeah. They've evaluated <laughs> it and they're happy. Fine. With okay, it. but yeah, just just uh, be, yes. aware, be aware. Yes. And no, I, I I think it's the um, it's the MIT license. Thing. Okay, so MIT is very reasonable. Yes. A GPL, yeah, sorry, definitely not. Yeah. But it's the very first thing. As soon as we said this is what we want to do, the security guys jumped in and said you're not doing anything to it. Check that it's okay to use. So um, I think Jekyll, if Jekyll got our vote, our vote, I think it's probably. So it's a great site generator. We went with Nanoc um, because I think a couple of our ideas met with the original creator and yeah. it's a good relationship there and. Um, some people have used it already, so it just it made sense to, to go with that too. Any other questions? Okay, then I think that's a wrap. Uh, thank okay. you very much. That was a great I, I always enjoy the, the more informal discussion.